Hi everyone, in this video I'm going to talk about hemostasis. Starting with the stages of hemostasis, first stage is primary hemostasis which involves pretty much platelets and one valid fracture, and then there is ultimate formation of a platelet plug which is the initial step for hemostasis. Then there is secondary hemostasis in which um, there are cascades of coagulation and we, may, we find a formation of fibrin clot. And then there's fibrin stabilization with a factor which is factor 13. We're going to read that in detail. Then we have fibrinolysis that once it's healed, then we uh, the, the clot starts to dissolve. So uh, let's talk about the primary hemostasis first. This is the cellular defense. Okay, whenever there is um, some kind of trigger, there is bleeding, there is a cut. Um, first of all, the body responds with uh, a release of vasoconstrictors and there is vasoconstriction over there. Uh, any vessel injury that would result in the collagen and subendothelial matrix exposure and they would release the vasoconstrictors. Right after that, the platelets would be activated and the platelets would start moving around because this cellular defense is um, involving platelets and one millibin factor predominantly. Primary hemostasis um, covers mostly uh, the mucocutaneous bleeding, the superficial cuts. Their main effect is on the superficial cuts and there's rapid cessation of bleeding because it, it just um, uh, um, starts or initiates immediately. So what happens is blood flow is impeded and platelets come into contact with damaged vessel wall and then the platelets start to be activated. How do they do it? First step is adhesion. Platelets adhere to subendothelium via von Willebrand factor. So this first step of adhesion that the platelets adhere to the subendothelial via von Willebrand factor is shown here. So what happens is there is exposed collagen fibers in the subendothelium and then there is one valibrin factor which gets attached to the subendothelium. The platelets are not going to directly get attached to um, the subendothelium. Okay, And one valibrin factor, um, it, has, it, is, it is secreted from the endothelial and it is also present within the platelets. So in the alpha granules of platelets, there is presence of one valibrin factors. So, um, uh, what does uh, what does it do? What are the roles of one valibrin factor? So, right here we can see that it's helping the platelets to bind to the damaged endothelium. Other than that, it also helps the platelets to bind with each other, which is also called as aggregation, which would be um, uh, the next step. So, one valibrin factor right here, and then there is another uh, um, role of one valibrin factor too that it um, combines with the factor eight, and it acts as a carrier for factor eight. Um, that we'll discuss in the cascades. But for now, the one valibrin factor then attaches to the endothelium, and then um, there is um, a glycoprotein one B. Um, um, a glycoprotein attached on the platelet which uh, get, gets attached to the von Willebrand factor right here so glycoprotein 1b and von Willebrand factor attaches and uh, both of them attach and then this is called as platelet adhesion right with the help of platelet uh, with the help of von Willebrand factor other than that, um, the platelets also get activated. There is integrin activation. The platelets change their shape and then they release some granules. Granules, there are um, alpha granules and then there are dense granules. In alpha granules, as I told you already, that there are von Willebrand factor. Other than von Willebrand factor, there is presence of fibrinogen. And there is presence of platelet factor 4. Okay, um, and in the dense granules, there is presence of ADP, calcium, and serotonin. All of these help trigger the the cascade for the uh, platelets. Help trigger the activation of platelets. Whenever these granules are gonna release, they will help the activation of platelets, and they'll help the formation of the platelet plug in one way or the other just like i mentioned fibrinogen here so right here we'll find a fibrinogen which will help adhere the which would help the platelets to adhere to each other not to the endothelium but to each other because platelets also have an other um glycoprotein attached to them which is 2b3a 
So this glycoprotein is just dormant when the platelet is not yet activated. But as soon as the platelet activates, it becomes um, active, the glycoprotein 2B3A, which then combines with the fibrinogen and thus the platelets combine with each other. So that's how um, there is aggregation. The next step, which is aggregation. So this is because of the activation of the platelets. So activated gl uh, glycoprotein 2B3A on platelets bind uh, with the soluble ligands. They bind with fibrinogen, which in, in return help them to bind with the other platelets, which results in aggregation and formation of a localized platelet plug. So this is the cellular defense body had a defense and they made a localized platelet plug a, a, a localized seal on that cut then the platelet plug is reinforced by the production of fibrin clot now we need a fibrin so that is done by the pathways uh, the coagulation cascade there are two types of pathways extrinsic and intrinsic extrinsic one is a little uh, the little one and but extrinsic one is the initiation pathway this is the one which starts first this is the initiation of secondary hemostasis but the the intrins uh, extrinsic one is the initiation but intrinsic one did i say intrinsic so extrinsic one is the initiation the smaller one but the intrinsic one is the amplification pathway so what happens is amplification, once a secondary hemostasis has started, the extrinsic has started, via positive feedback, the intrinsic pathway also gets activated. So both the extrinsic and intrinsic pathways converge onto a common pathway, which I have highlighted in yellow, which is 10 to 10A, which is the main part of this cascade because it is common to both. So um, from 10 to 10A, they converge to this common pathway and which results in thrombin generation and then fibrin formation. This fibrin is formed and then it is stabilized. Fibrin is formed, but it is not uh, working as a mesh, as a network. So that's why we need stabilization of that fibrin, which is done by factor 13. So there is a conversion from a soluble to an insoluble cross-linked clot, which is fibrin stabilization. So factor 13 right here uh, helps forming um, cross-linked fibrin clot. It's not fibrin, it's fib fibrin. Yeah. Okay. And then once healing is initiated, this clot then dissolves. Um, clot dis dissolution is mediated by the fibrinolytic system. Then the fibrinolytic or also known as thrombolytic system comes in place and then um, they are lysed fibrino lysed as its name indicate they are dissolved so now i'm going to talk about this path these pathways as we have talked about this image and uh, the the primary hemostasis already let's talk a little bit about the secondary hemostasis which includes extrinsic and intrinsic pathway so um a little bit to remember extrinsic pathway is the one which is smaller and it is the one which starts in the first place and um, extrinsic pathway is the one which we uh, test by the PT, PT test, prothrombin time. And the intrinsic pathway, which is comparatively longer and which is the one which amplifies the formation of fibrin, is tested by PTT. Extrinsic involves clotting factor 7 with the tissue factor so tissue factor and clotting factor 7 whenever there is a it means it is the activated form so whenever there is tissue damage there is production of tissue factor and when the tissue factor combines with um, factor 7 uh, which is also uh, called a 7a um, in the presence of when the, when it is activated um, then um, this pathway is the extrinsic pathway because in return they are they have to just activate 10 to 10 a which is the common pathway um, tissue factor is also called as thromboplastin so this tissue factor is also called as thromboplastin we're gonna use it um in the future explanations okay now for the intrinsic pathway this intrinsic pathway starts with factor 12 this factor 12 gets activated by high molecular weight kinenogen and pre um, which uh, basically indicates that uh, the secondary hemostasis have been initiated. 
so the high molecular weight kinenogen and the precalicrin activate the factor 12 to factor 12a and then um, this factor 12a with the help of high molecular weight kinenogen activates factor 11 and then that activates factor 9 now 9 um, needs factor 8 with it as a cofactor to activate factor 10 so um we are going backwards from 12 to 11 11 we are not going to go to 10 because 10 is the common one we know that we we're going to skip to factor 9 and the 9 needs factor 8 as a cofactor to turn activate factor 10 now the ones which i've encircled um red um the 11 and then um 9 um sorry not 9 8 and um 8 11 and 5 down here so um these are the ones and 13 also right here so the uh there are four which i have encircled um red 13 5 8 and 11 5 8 11 and 13 these are the ones which are activated by factor 2 2a and which is factor 2a uh, see you, you can see that on the uh, equation that there is presence of factor 2a factor 2a factor 2a so what's factor 2a factor 2a is thrombin so once it starts this cascade starts there is production of thrombin and then there is production of fibrin then thrombin in return amplifies these steps by activating more and more factor 5 8 11 and 13 so this is amplified by thrombin so more and more uh, conversion to uh, or production of fibrin occurs thrombin helps to, to, to them helps them and then the common pathway which is 10 to 10 a after that there is 5 which turns to 5a with the help of thrombins and then there's calcium there's phospholipids which help turning prothrombin to thrombin 2 to 2a and fibrinogen is also known as 1 and it turns into fibrin which is 1a now this fibrin with the help of factor 13a uh, makes a cross-linked fibrin clot which will lead to cessation of bleeding now um, um this is the intrinsic pathway um there is one extrinsic and intrinsic um, now in the intrinsic pathway um there is presence of um um, the, um some of uh okay i'm not gonna tell that right now uh now just think about um uh, the fourth stage which is fibrinolysis so now fibrinogen or the fibrin both of them now they are going to con uh, get back and con get converted into fibrinogen degradation products or fibrin and de uh, fibrin degradation products and d dimers so uh with the help of plasmin plasmin which was um at some time just plasminogen not plasmin itself so plasminogen is activated to plasmin which breaks down fibrinogen or fibrin into fibrin or fibrinogen degradation products and d dimers and this is done with the help of tissue plasminogen activator streptokinase or urokinase so these help the degradation of fibrinogen and fibrin so uh, what if um, uh, we give we find that uh, some person have um, uh, some embolus formation um, then we give them streptokinase and then we measure uh, what should we measure um, to uh, to determine whether to monitor whether um, there is any response to streptokinase or not FTPs or D dimers we we are gonna um, even though denimers are not the perfect thing to measure, they are not very specific, they are sensitive. But in comparison, uh, if we compare FTPs and D-dimers, we are going to measure D-dimers. Because fibrin is the one which is the clot. And fibrin is the one which converts into FTPs and D-dimers. 
but fibrinogen is the one which which is just converted to fdps so even if there is um, um some amount of fibrinogen uh, going around in the blood it gets uh, converted into fibrinogen degradation products right so that would be a false positive if we are measuring fdps uh, because that that might be con- get got converted from fibrinogen and not just fibrin so we have to measure d dimers because when the fibrin is broken down then we have d dimers and fdps so i should remove this arrow and fibrin when it's broken down it converts into d dimers and fdps right here okay these are the two pathways uh moving forward um in this table we are going to discuss some commonly used tests of hemostasis um in the primary hemostasis we measure platelet count uh which should be between 130 to 400 and uh in the early times we also used to do bleeding time in which we used to put give a superficial cut to a person um and just a superficial cut because we are t- we are measuring primary hemostasis so superficial cuts are um um controlled by primary primary hemostasis and then we used to measure the bleeding time uh, until unless we uh, we we kept on uh, we keep on putting the um, filter paper on the cut and until um, there's formation of a platelet plug and there's no more blood on the filter paper then that's the bleeding time but um, we don't do it anymore i believe and um, the examples of associated diagnosis would be low in itp uh, so platelet count would be low in itp hemolytic uremic syndrome ttp dic and hit so all of them would have thrombocytopenia they would have decreased platelet count and that's why there uh, there is um um uh, primary as there is primary hemostasis the platelet has been consumed so the platelet count in the serum would be decreased because it's already consumed so if we think that oh there are low platelets so there is no formation of thrombus no there is coagulation going on in all of these and the platelets are consumed that is why not like all of these not in uh, not in the heparin induced thrombocytopenia but the like in dic the platelet has been consumed that's why it is low then in secondary we measure ptt as uh, i mentioned already in intrinsic pathway it should be between 28 to 38 seconds um uh, intrinsic pathway includes factor 8 9 11 and 12 and then the common pathway um ptt is used to monitor heparin and ergato brand therapy so that is why over here we are going to read that consider ptt uh, when there is iv heparin treatment going on or ergato brand um ergatro ban monitoring because heparin is um on the um intrinsic pathway side on the um uh, the longer uh, the the intrinsic pathway side heparin involves right here um how does heparin works so uh, work heparin works by activating the antithrombin 3 so antithrombin 3 right here is under heparin so that is why um heparin is used in the uh if if, if a person is um you know, having heparin therapy then there is um um we got to measure ptt as it involves the intrinsic pathway um and then it is prolonged in hemophilia a and b if there is factor deficiency and it is um also prolonged if there is lupus anticoagulant present in 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 um in um, antiphospholipid syndrome there is lupus anticoagulant present but antiphospholipid syndrome is a hypercoagulable state then why is ptt prolonged if it is a hypercoagulable state it's just because of the these antibodies present in the apla and that's what what uh, that's where their name is from lupus anticoagulant then we have PT, which we measure in extrinsic pathways, for extrinsic pathways, um, uh, 10 to 13 seconds. Um, factor 7 is involved because in PT, uh, I mean in extrin- extrinsic, there's literally just one factor, which is factor 7. We can different, um, uh, sorry, uh, and the common pathway too. So we can also think about factor 10. 
This is prolonged in vitamin K deficiency, vitamin K antagonist therapy, warfarin, and factor 7 deficiency. So vitamin K is on this side, on the intrinsic side. Uh, warfarin is on the intrinsic side. Um, we read that heparin is on the extrinsic side. That is why we're going to, uh, sorry, intrinsic side. That is why we're going to do the um, PTT. But warfarin is on the extrinsic side. So that is why we're going to do PT. And similarly, vitamin K, we do um, on the extrinsic side as we have pro uh, protein C and protein S. Um, oh, sorry. No, vitamin K. Uh, is basically the one which produces um, uh, yes factor 2 which is common 7 which is right here in extrinsic 9 which is only 1 in intrinsic um, and 10 which is common and protein C and protein S so vitamin K is uh, required for the synthesis of these of these factors right so, and warfarin is also working against vitamin K. So, warfarin and vitamin K are going to be uh, monitored by PT. Um, INR is basically the ratio between patient's prothrombin time and the normal prothrombin time. So, INR is used to monitor um, as we are talking about PT in warfarin, so warfarin therapy and for assessment of hepatic function, liver function too. So, liver function is being assessed by um, INR. And right here, we'll see um, that PT and INR is um, considered when we have to assess, monitor warfarin, liver disease, that is what we read as hepatic function. So how do we test hepatic function? PT or PTT? PT. And risk factor for vitamin K deficiency that if there's malabsorption, cholestasis, malnutrition, cystic fibrosis, then we're going to consider PT. Okay. So um, then there's a fourth test, which is mixing studies. So what we do is we mix patient's plasma, one ratio one with some normal plasma. And we can differentiate if there is inhibition of coagulation factors or there is a deficiency of coagulation factors. So if uh, the coagulation time gets normalized when we mix it, then there must be a deficiency of single coagulation factor. But if it's still not normal, then there is um, the, there's some kind of inhibitor present to activate that coagulant, uh, the, that coagulant factor. Uh, so normalization of coagulation time if deficiency of single coagulation factor but normalization may not occur if multiple coagulation factors are deficient um, if there is lack of normalization if inhibitor present so uh, if inhibitor present of course it's not going to get normalized because um, that patient's plasma does not have anything the patient plasma does not have coagulation factor and when we mixed it with the normal one they got the coagulation factor and th thus the coagulation time was normalized then uh, we'll talk about fibrinolysis, fibrin breaks down, the normal time is more than 90 minutes, that's, that's how much time uh, it's going to take to break down fibrin, but it could be shortened as when there's increased fibrinolysis in DIC or factor 13 deficiency. So whenever there's factor 13 deficiency, of course, um, there would be no factor 13 to stabilize it, so there would be more lysis, so it is shortened, and in DIC also. In DIC, there would be um, thrombosis going on everywhere. And there would be shortened time for fibrinolysis. Maybe shortened fibrinolysis would be quick. We also test fibrinogen, D-dimer, specific factor assays like factor 8, lupus anticoagulant, and some von Willebrand tests. Like one million factor antigen, ristocetin, cofactor activity, factor 8. Von Willebrand and factor 8 go hand in hand. Okay. And then there's this table, general rule of thumb, signs and symptoms of disorders of hemostasis. So if there's any problem in primary hemostasis, the platelets or von Willebrand factor, surface cuts would be, uh, there would be prolonged bleeding in surface cuts. It would be long, excessive. 
but in if the second problem in secondary it would be still long it can be slightly prolonged because secondary is not involved primary is involved in the ones which are superficial mucosal like nasal gingival um, vaginal and gi tract also and the skin but secondary are involved in the deep ones like joints muscles excessive um like trauma but um the the um effect is very immediate in the primary one and it is delayed in the secondary one uh lesions uh in the primary ones we'll have petechiae ecchymosis and in secondary we will have hematrosis hematomas these causes of prolonged ptd without bleeding include so ptd gets prolonged um ptd is the one in the intrinsic factor right um this table is really great um so um pt is being um the coagulation factors which are involving pt is the uh, extrinsic factor pathway only 7 and then 2 5 10 which are common and fibrinogen which is common and ptt uh in which heparin also includes and then factor Eight, nine, eleven, twelve, and then the common ones two, two, five, ten, and fibrinogen. So, what causes prolonged PTD? If we have early contact factor deficiency, the early contact factors, the uh, the ones which start the intrinsic pathway, factor twelve, the um, high molecular weight kinogen, and the precalicrine. If we have def, these are deficient, then of course it would take time in PTD. It would take time in intrinsic pathway. If there's lupus anticoagulant, this just remember it by heart that even if antiphospholipid syndrome is a hypercoagulable state, lupus anticoagulant would increase. the ptd and an inappropriate blood draw there is a little bit contamination of heparin because heparin will prolong the intrinsic pathway and then erythrocytosis we will consider ptd while we are monitoring heparin agatrobran and in hemophilia um, factor 11 deficiency and severe von willebrand disease we will consider pt in warfarin liver disease and vitamin k deficiency and we can consider both ptt and pt in suspected dic in a trauma patient or some patient who is requiring massive transfusion protocol in a bleeding patient in a patient receiving thrombolytic therapy thrombolytic or fibrinolytic so if we think that we are giving a thrombolytic therapy right here like uh, tissue plasma antigen activator streptokinase we are giving some thrombolytic acti- um um go- there is some some thrombolytic activity going on therapy going on then we can measure both pt and ptd So this was a little introduction of uh, stages of hemostasis. The phases are primary, which includes vascular response and platelet plug formation via von Willebrand factor. Secondary, which is fibrin clot formation, then stabilization, then ultimately fibrinol 